lovelies, welcome back to my channel. So today we're going to be talking all about Joan Crawford and I'll be discussing 10 facts about her as well as reading a vintage interview from 1960 with Joan Crawford. So I found an article from a 1960 March 4th Glamour magazine with Joan Crawford. It's called Glamour Comes from Carefully Planned Program. So here is the article from 1960 Glamour. Two women whose faces are their fortune agree that beauty is a present from nature, but the elusive quality called glamour comes from planning. The two are Joan Crawford, a spellbinder in the Grand Manor, and Linda Lee Mead, who as Miss America of 1960 is a relative newcomer to the field. The movie Queen and the Beauty Queen met for the first time this week when Miss Mead, an English major at the University of Mississippi, came to New York for the annual Pepsi Cola convention. The beverage firm, which Miss Crawford's late husband, Alfred Steele Head, is one of the sponsors of the annual Miss American pageant in Atlantic City. Over soft drinks, the three of us sat in Miss Crawford's suite at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel for some girl talk on the ingredients of beauty, glamour, and sex appeal. Well, said Miss Crawford of the big eyes and red gold hair, I don't think that confection, like prettiness, that the candy box look is beauty. On the long haul, it's bone structure that counts, and that you're born with. Both dismiss the Bridget Bardot types as something less than beautiful. Mill votes to that contrary. The baby doll face is not my idea of beauty, said Miss Mead. Nor is the unkept look. I'll tell you the first ingredient of glamour, says Miss Crawford. It's cleanliness. Amen, says Miss America, a 20-year-old brunette who looked like she had just stepped from the shower. And, continued Joan, glamour is planning. She cited as an example hers for the convention, at which she was official hostess. She had moved from the Fifth Avenue apartment to the hotel for a week. Every dress, every hat, purse, a pair of shoes, jewelry, everything planned right down to the last hanky, she said. Time consuming, yes, but you have to do it. You have to be so prepared that you walk into a room completely relaxed and no one realizes that all of this was no accident. Miss America demurred in trying to define sex appeal in a woman, but said that in a man, cleanliness again is a major factor. Why is it, asked Miss Crawford, that men seem to think they don't need a deodorant? Miss Lee laughed and added, I know what you mean. You see a man who's just dead attractive and you're dying for him to ask you to dance. And then you get close up on the floor she wrinkled her nose in disgust. So I thought that was an interesting article from 1960. And I know after doing other research on Joan Crawford that she was kind of a perfectionist and definitely a neat freak and really liked to organize everything. So I'm not surprised that she would say those things, but it's interesting hearing this old interview. So Joan Crawford has gone for more than four decades, but is still remembered as the quintessential star of the golden age of Hollywood. Her career lasted from 1925 until 1970. Here are some interesting facts about Joan Crawford that I did not know. So Joan Crawford's real age is unknown. Though no birth certificate exists for Joan Crawford, everyone agrees on the March 23rd date of her birth. The year is another matter. Crawford always claimed 1908 which would put her age at 16 when she was placed under contract to MGM in January 1925. Other sources like IMDb say 1905 and some say 1904, which biographer Donald Spoto argues is impossible since her brother Harold was born in September 1903. The consensus seemed to have settled on 1906 as the most likely year of Crawford's birth, but there's still no proof. And fact number two, she was discovered in a chorus. Joan grew up mostly poor in San Antonio, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas City, Missouri. The family was abandoned by her father around the time of the girl's birth, and her mother took in laundry to make ends meet, a possible source of Joan's later horror of wire hangers. A stepfather came and went, leaving Joan with a new name, Billy Casson. By 1922, Billy, which is Joan, was winning Charleston contests in Kansas City and headed to Chicago and then New York to dance on stage. She was spotted in the chorus of The Passing Show of 1924 by MGM producer, given a screen test and offered a contract. And fact number three is her new name was chosen in a public contest. MGM chief Louis B. Mayer saw potential in the new contract player, but not as either Lucille or Billy. 
A thousand dollar public renaming contest was announced and the winning entry seemed to satisfy everyone except the bearer of the name, who thought it sounded like crawfish. Her good friend and sometime co-star William Haynes nicknamed her Crawford Cranberry. And the next fact is Crawford was a petite, freckle-faced redhead. She seemed so big on screen. Well, the eyes and mouth were certainly large and vivid, but the woman herself was barely 5'3". As for the complexion and hair color, the freckles were erased with makeup and the hair changed with the role. In addition, Crawford was rarely seen in color until 1953's Port Song, and by that time her appearance had reached a height of artificiality that rendered the question of natural hair color. It's true, I always thought Joan Crawford was really tall. She just kind of looks tall on camera. And the next fact is her connection with Clark Gable was possibly romantic. Even though she had four husbands and many lovers, Crawford was also close to Clark Gable. Gable co-starred with Crawford in eight movies, more than anyone else, and the two are rumored to have pursued an affair on and off for decades. They were certainly good friends, and when Gable's wife, Carol Lombard, was killed in a 1942 plane crash, Crawford took her scheduled role in the film They All Kissed the Bride and donated her salary to the American Red Cross. And the next fact is she used illegal baby brokers to adopt her children. Joan Crawford adopted three children, Christina and twins Kathy and Cindy, as a single parent which was prohibited in California. She used illegal baby brokers and traveled with baby Christina, who was born to a young unwed woman in Hollywood, to New York and Nevada to legalize the adoption. Her other child, a son, was adopted when Crawford was married to Philip Terry. For a brief time, the boy's name was Philip Terry II. When the marriage dissolved, he was rechristened to Christopher Crawford. And the next fact is she was labeled as box office poison. Though Crawford found a regular place in the top 10 money-making star polls during the early to mid-1930s, in 1938, she, along with Marlene Dietrich, Greta Garbo, and Katherine Hepburn, were labeled box office poison by the Independent Theater Owners Association of America. A series of substandard roles dimmed her star for a bit, but Joan was always good at comebacks. And the next fact is, a director accused her of wearing shoulder pads while filming Mildred Pierce. After she left MGM, Crawford tested and won the title role in Mildred Pierce at Warner Brothers. Her director, Michael Curtis, was a notorious tyrant, and on the first day of production, he became enraged by what he perceived as shoulder pads and reportedly ripped Joan's dress at the neckline, only to uncover bare. If next fact is, she feuded with Mercedes Cambridge on set. The alcohol field conflict spilled over onto the film's Arizona location. Let's just say that at one point, McCambridge's clothes ended up spread on the highway outside the actress's motel. On the other hand, the legendary Crawford, Betty Davis feud during filming of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane was apparently a publicity stunt. And the next fact is she became a Christian scientist later in life. Star's last movie, the B-level shocker Trog, was released in 1970, after which she did a few TV roles and then retired to her Manhattan apartment. She became a Christian scientist and, according to some sources, stopped drinking. It was due to her faith and that she refused aggressive treatment for the cancer which eventually led to her death on May 10th, 1977. She didn't have a great fortune to leave, but her twins were provided for, as were a number of charities. Fatefully, Christina and Christopher were not. And here are some famous quotes by Joan Crawford, and the first one is, I, Joan Crawford, I believe in the dollar. Everything I earn, I spend. And the next quote is, I need sex for a clear complexion, but I'd rather do it for love. I never go outside unless I look like Joan Crawford, the movie star. If you want to see the girl next door, go next door. I've always known what I wanted, and that was beauty in every form. And the next one is, send me flowers while I'm alive. They won't do a damn bit of good after I'm dead. And the next one is, love is fire, but whether it's going to warm your heart or burn down your house, you can never tell. And the next quote is, I think the most important thing a woman can have, next to talent of course, is a, her hairdresser. And the last quote by Joan Crawford is, if you have an ounce of common sense and one good friend, you don't need an analyst. So I've always been fascinated in Joan Crawford and I love reading old interviews with her. So if there's any other things you want me to find out about her, let me know in the comments below. And thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys again soon. Bye.